music. That happy music means it's time for the Money Show on Sunday afternoon, October 30th, the day before Halloween, 2005. And this is Harry Brown with my very, very good co-host, uh, John B. Chandler from Austin, Texas. And we're here to talk about anything financial, your savings, your investments, uh, anything that you have on your mind. The phone number here is 1-800-259-9231. The main part of the broadcast will probably be uh, a continuation of our discussion of silver, which we started last week. But before we do that, I think we have some questions that have come in that need addressing. John, what do we have? Hi, Harry. Uh, nice to be with you here today, or more likely, as they say in some parts of Texas, I'm mighty proud to be here this <laughs> afternoon. We do have uh, some questions. We've got to have a couple of questions from Brad in Cincinnati uh, that I think we should get to in a few minutes because I believe, if I'm uh, correct here, you've received a question about Swiss uh, banks that's come in to you uh, directly and recently. So, uh, Harry, why don't you explain the question or problem or issue? Sure. And then we'll get on to the questions from Brad in Cincinnati. Okay. For the permanent portfolio, which uh, I recommend, as most people listening to this show know, to be 25% in stocks, 25% in bonds, 25% in gold, and 25% in cash, I recommend that you consider having some of the gold in a Swiss bank, in other words, or an Austrian bank, or somewhere outside the country in which you live, because gold is... Uh, uh, an asset that is nobody's liability. Nobody owes it to you, like stocks are owed to you, bonds are owed to you, uh, cash is probably in a money market fund or treasury bills, which are owed to you. But gold, you actually have the asset in your possession, and therefore it is completely independent of governments or anything else. And a nice place to keep it is overseas in an Austrian or Swiss bank. Now, the problem is that... Um, I have recommended that you have that gold in a custodial account where uh, it is your property and you can go pick it up anytime you want and the bank doesn't owe it to you. It's just keeping it for you like a warehouse. But now banks in Switzerland are deciding that they don't want to keep gold that way anymore. They want to keep it in what is called a claim account, which is uh, uh, like a bank account where they owe you so many ounces of gold and your gold is kept right in the pot with all the other gold that the bank might hold, either in their vaults or in a warehouse somewhere, but you can't walk in and say, I want to see my gold, uh, which might be a bag of uh, gold coins or something else that you have purchased and left on storage with them. And that's unfortunate, but there's nothing we can do about it. The banks are uh, just finding that they're not making enough profit on the custodial accounts, and they can make a little more on the claim accounts, and uh, that's the way it is. Now, I'm searching around Switzerland as best I can from here to try to find a bank that still will give you a custodial account for your gold. And if I find one, you can be sure I will let you know on this program. And that's the news on that. The, the other question that has come up is about living in Switzerland. Some people think, well, you know, if things get worse in this country, I need to find another country to live in. What's it like to live in Switzerland? Well, I lived there for six years from 1976 to 1983, and I loved it there. But like every other country, Switzerland has deteriorated over the last 25 years, just like the United States, just like Canada, just like the others. But uh, relatively speaking, it's still probably, on the whole, a much better environment in which to live than the United States is. And there's a lot to that story, and maybe one day we'll cover it on this show. But uh, just know that it probably is not what it was 25 years ago, but it's probably better than the United States. And that's all i got to say about Switzerland and Swiss banks. All right, Harry. Well, uh, let's go on now uh, quickly to the uh, uh, questions from Brad in Cincinnati. Uh, Brad, uh, first question is as follows. When I look at the trading prices for bullion coin, I notice that the types of coin trade at different values. For instance, the U.S. Gold Eagle is usually more expensive than, say, the Canadian Maple Leaf. Even though they're the same one ounce of gold. Yes. And uh, that uh, continuing with his uh, question here, uh, he gets into that. 
Uh, it's uh, more expensive than the maple leaf, the cougar ran, and so forth. I know the coins all contain the same amount of gold, so what else accounts for the price difference? Is one variety of coin better to hold than another, or do you recommend simply buying whatever is cheapest at the time of purchase? John, uh, this is a good question that you've investigated, and I'd like you to answer, but I do want to point out before you do that what he's talking about is the premium. You you buy a, a one-ounce gold coin, and it fluctuates with the price of gold. But in addition to paying whatever one ounce of gold would cost today, you pay a slight premium of 3 to 5% generally, sometimes more, sometimes less. And that premium is what you're paying for the packaging, for the fact that you have a, a one-ounce coin that says one ounce on it and you can take it and sell it to anybody. It doesn't have to be assayed or anything else. And uh, uh, you get that premium back not always the full amount and sometimes more, but uh, the premium is always there, and as I say, the price fluctuates with the price of gold. Now, what have you found in investigating this, John? Well, I have found that, of course, there is always a premium because, there, as you said, there are other factors associated with the shipping, insurance, uh, and many costs, and so forth. I also noticed down through the years that the premium seems to increase in volatile markets. If the markets are relatively steady, uh, and there's little risk of holding the coin from day to day, uh, the premium is smaller. If the, if the market price is volatile, then the dealers will t- t- uh, typically increase the premium uh, to handle uh, some uh, additional risk if they hold. But to answer this question, I did uh, contact a well-known, uh, long, long-time 30, 40-year coin dealer, member of PNA and all the right organizations, and uh, ask him for his take on this question. And here's what he said. He said, uh, well, basically, Kruger ends have fallen out of favor. They were banned for a good while at one time, and when the ban came off, they just never caught on for political or other reasons. He says the only ones that are trading now, the only cougar ads that are trading now, are basically from people who need or want to sell them. There's simply no major supply available in the United States. He said if somebody put an order in to him for 50 cougar ads or 100 cougar ads, he couldn't fill it. Nor does he know of any supplier he could go to to fill it. He'd have to wait until they could be gathered up. And he also added that maple leaves, he believes, sell for a little less from the Canadian government than the Gold Eagle sells from the U.S. government. So they cost the supplier a little bit more. And besides all that, he says here in oh, the... Which, uh, you, you mean the uh, Eagles cost the supplier a little more? Yes, the Eagles cost them. Right. The government sells them to the suppliers for a little bit more than the Canadian government sells the Maple Leafs. Right. And he adds that besides all that, here in the United States, the gold eagle is, has a little more desirability because of uh, nationalism, uh, patriotism, uh, so forth. And besides, he thinks it's a nice-looking coin. But all those things together add up to the premium be a little bit higher for the uh, gold eagle uh, than from other coins that a person might buy. Probably more marketable to somebody who isn't uh, really uh, knowledgeable about coins, too. Uh, because it is from the U.S. government. Well, that music means we need to take our first break, and we will be back right after this, and we will be continuing the silver story here shortly. And so you don't want to go away. This exciting finish is coming up. This is Harry Brown with John Chandler. Stay tuned. This is Harry Brown. My book, Fail Safe Investing, will tell you what you need to know to create your own bulletproof investment portfolio, one that will protect you whatever the future brings, prosperity, inflation, recession, even depression, and it will protect you without your having to predict the future or tinker with the portfolio. Best news of all, at libertyfree.com, you can download the book for only $9.75. That's right, just nine seventy five. You can read the book on your computer screen or print it out and read it in your easy chair. If you're tired of losing money on your investments, tired of the pressure of looking for the best investments, 
Here's the way to have your own bulletproof portfolio, no matter how big or small your savings. To get a free sample chapter from Fail Safe Investing, just go to libertyfree.com right now. That's libertyfree.com. Welcome back. This is Harry Brown with John Chandler. And, uh, John, uh, we were a- a- answering questions from readers. What's the next one on the docket? Well, before we get off of the uh, gold coin question, uh, he asked one good question I think we should answer, and that is, is one variety of coin better to hold than another, or do you recommend simply buying whatever is cheapest at the time of pur- purchase? And I would like to add my two cents worth. Sure. Uh, and then when I'm finished, but uh, since you're famous, you can add your three cents worth. <laughs> <laughs> my opinion on that subject is that uh, you should uh, buy a coin that has uh, a very, very liquid market, uh, such that you, no matter what, no matter when, it has the greatest chance of you being able to liquidate it at a moment's notice to anybody uh, in the world anywhere. And that means a highly identifiable, highly desirable coin. And for U.S. citizens, uh, I believe that certainly means the gold eagle. Uh, Harry, your three cents worth? Uh, oh, I couldn't add anything to that. You got it exactly right. One thing I will mention, though, is that a lot of people don't realize that you can keep those coins in an IRA if you want. And uh, the same thing is true for a 401K or any other kind of tax-deferred uh, program that you have, so you don't have to uh, worry about that. And uh, if, um, if your money is tied up in such ways that most of it's in an IRA or most of it's in a 401K, then this is a way of keeping some gold, even though you don't have it in a bank overseas. You at least have it with a broker in the United States, and you're at least holding gold. And so uh, don't overlook that possibility. But uh, I agree uh, completely with your answer, John. That's a good idea uh, for IRAs, uh, and you might look into uh, self-directed IRAs or others that allow you to do that. Let's move on uh, with the next question from Ross uh, from Cincinnati, and uh, he's state. By way of reason.com comes a report that followed the investments of U.S. Senators over a five-year period. It found that the Senators beat the market 12% of the time annually. I wonder if he means beats the market by 12% uh, annually. Uh, any event, uh, for reference, in the private sector, a mutual fund manager who beats the market 2 to 3% of the time, and I hear again, I think he may mean beats the market by 2 or 3%. Yeah, the 2 or 3% better than the S&P. Yes, that's what I think he means. Uh, anyway, uh, a mutual fund manager beats the market 2 or 3% is considered a financial genius. Oh, ho, ho. Obviously, senators are involved in insider activities that put Martha Stewart to shame. What I'd like to know is this, Harry. How can I encourage any of the investment firms out there to start a mutual fund that mimics the transaction of U.S. senators? It would be a smashing success. Alternatively, if you know of any way I can find or view the investment transactions of U.S. senators and speculate based on their activities. Harry, uh, your three cents will be very worthwhile here. Well, here's two, anyway. Um, the problem is the senators report this, uh, I believe, on a quarterly basis or whatever it is. It's a periodic basis, and they tell you what they have done already. They don't tell you, I'm going to buy such and such stock tomorrow, so you ought to mimic that. And so it's very, very difficult to mimic what they do because what you do is going to be after the fact you're going to uh, get into the stocks that they got into at a much lower price. So I don't know how you can mimic it. As far as what they're doing, it's very possible that what they are acting on is information that they have knowing that a certain law is going to go into effect and they have somebody to advise them and say, well, when this law goes into effect, this stock is going to do very well as a result of it because its competitors are not going to be able to 
to do this, and so they're going to drop out of the market. And so the senator goes ahead and buys that stock then, and he hasn't acted on inside information because he hasn't talked to anybody inside the company. And uh, uh, he can't be accused of insider uh, using insider information. So it's a, a sweet deal if I understand it. Now, you know, this is just my impression as an outsider, and I don't know how to get around the, the wall to find out exactly what's going on inside of Congress that makes this possible, but I'm sure that the uh, representatives in the House of Representatives are uh, doing just as sweetly with all this as the senators are. I, I have seen those uh, kind of studies before and uh, thought about it, but there, there really is nothing we can do to try to take advantage of it, at least not that I know of. If somebody th comes up with an idea, I'd be glad to hear about it. Well, as someone who's been involved in the mutual fund industry for a long, long time, uh, I can say that uh, it has been looked into, and if there was a way to package that idea, uh, and it could be marketed by being a political insider fund or something of that nature, it probably would be very, very successful. Uh, but I don't know of anyone who's seriously looked into the matter. Uh, it is an intriguing idea. Uh, even if you only were looking at what they had done, that may be some clue and have them carry on over into the future. So uh, it's an intriguing idea, but in terms of practical way to execute it, uh, I don't think anyone's found a good way to do that. Okay, Harry, uh, suppose we return to the fun uh, uh, issue of silver and the silver uh, investment world. Uh, last week uh, we started off with a couple of... Uh, uh, arguments in favor of silver. Uh, one, the ratios were all-time low for silver against all other uh, commodities, and uh, when that happens, it generally means that commodity, namely silver, is poised to go up. The other argument was that uh, uh, the silver supply is dwindling. The above-ground supplies are gradually being depleted uh, because the consumption is exceeding that of the production, and it's just a matter of time before we run out of silver and there's a elasticity, uh, any elasticity of uh, silver supply. And uh, you were starting at the beginning of the silver story of modern times and had brought us up to about uh, 1980. So uh, why don't you just uh, take a few minutes and review the early part of the silver story and let's pick up with 1980 and see if we can't get to today uh, before the program's over. That's yes, right. In the, uh, over, over the years, the federal government had accumulated an enormous supply of silver because of laws in the 1800s that encouraged the production of silver and bring it to the, the government and get $1.29 for every ounce that you mine, which was way above the market, and so it encouraged silver mining and encouraged an enormous supply of the government. And that was used then in the 1950s and 1960s when silver suddenly became in demand for electronics and photography and and other uses, and the government then was in the position of trying to hold the price down to a dollar twenty-nine, which was supposedly the monetary price of silver. And we'll continue this story after this break, and we'll wrap up what we covered last week, and then get on to the period from 1980 on. This is Harry Brown with John Chandler. We'll be back in just a couple of minutes. This is Harry Brown. Have you lost money in stocks over the past few years? From 2000 through 2002, the stock market lost a third of its value. But during those three years, a bulletproof portfolio gained 9%. And over the past 34 years, such a portfolio gained an average of over 9% per year throughout periods of prosperity, inflation, and recession, with no wide swings in value. My book, Failsafe Investing, shows how you can have that kind of portfolio for yourself. And now you can download the book for only $9.75. You don't have to rely on alleged market wizards or stay up late worrying about your savings. Failsafe Investing will show you how to have the security that you crave. 
Go to LibertyFree.com to see a sample chapter of Fail Safe Investing and then start protecting the savings you've worked so hard to acquire. That's LibertyFree.com. Welcome back. Harry Brown here with John Chandler. We're talking about the silver story of the 1960s through the present. And uh, to wrap up the early part of it, in in the 1970s, the government just gave up and let the price fluctuate. And any time you price control something for a month or a year, uh, when the price is finally released, you usually see a shooting upward that is much faster than prices are rising in other commodities and other products, simply because it's making up for lost time. Well, in this case, we're not talking about a month or a year. We're talking about almost a century of uh, price controls, but very definitely two decades of trying to hold that price at $1.29. And so from $1.29 in 1971, the price rose to $50 in 1980, and it was only at $50 for just a day or so, and then uh, it started to, to work its way downward. And as John pointed out last week in our newsletter, we uh, recommended that people put in a stop loss at somewhere around $40, and uh, so a lot of people got out at $40. But what happened then was that a lot of investment advisors who had said at a dollar twenty nine it's going to five dollars and then when it got to five dollars they said oh it's going to twenty dollars and when it got to twenty dollars they said oh it's going to forty dollars or fifty dollars and when it got to fifty dollars they said oh it's going to a hundred dollars don't stop now uh, the price is going to get higher and higher and they didn't get out and they didn't put in stop losses and when the price crashed in 1980, from $50, it went all the way down to $5 for a day or two, came back up to $20, and eventually leveled off at about $10 or so for the next, uh, I don't know, many months. And then finally, it fell into a trading range way down in the mid uh, single digits, or in other words, around $5 or so. And throughout the 1980s, it was in that position. Now, these investment advisors who had recommended at $50, that it was still going higher, now had to justify the fact that they did not get out at $50. And so they started talking about $200 as being the, the price that silver was going to, and just hang on. And the stories that had been told during the 1960s and 70s about the great silver shortage, which there was a shortage of silver to satisfy the consumption demand that now existed for photography and electronics and other products that had not used silver before the 1950s or 60s. And uh, they, they kept repeating this story about the shortage. And they developed other stories uh, as the reasons that silver eventually was going to go to $200. So a lot of people got into silver during the 1980s and the 1990s on the, the promise that Silver was eventually going to erupt, but it, it, of course, was always going to be imminent that this was something that was going to happen very, very soon. Uh, nobody's going to get into silver in the 1980s if it's going to take 20 years before something happens. Well, it's turned out to take 20 years, and the stories are still being repeated today, and at some point, they are going to be very, very true. At some point, Silver is going to take off upward. It has been in this low range for much too long. But we cannot predict the timing using economic information. And so it may happen tomorrow. It may happen next month. It may not happen for another year or two. It may not happen for another five or ten years. We just don't know. Uh, but a lot of people think that it's imminent. And uh, they have raised certain arguments to indicate that silver is just poised uh, to accelerate upward. And, John, let's deal with those arguments now. Well, the first argument is that, uh, and this is some uh, I've seen several different places, uh, that the historical ratios of silver to other things, like oil, food, gold, and almost everything else, uh, silver is at historical lows. And when an investment is at historical low compared to everything else, 
then that usually means it's primed to go up. And one of the things they always seem to throw in is the, quote, magic silver-to-gold ratio. Mm -hmm. And I know the silver-to-gold ratio, you have done a great deal of uh, research on down through the years because I have seen uh, a number of their articles and uh, discussions on that particular subject. So first, I think it would be worthwhile to deal with the magic of the silver-to-gold ratio. Yes, the... uh Historical uh, ratio that I hear most often or used to hear, I don't uh, pay that much attention to it now, was that uh, gold should be at 30 to 1 to silver, and some people say 15 to 1. But right now, uh, it is at about 50, well, about 60 to 1. And uh, so silver on that basis is greatly undervalued compared with gold. But what's being missed here is that in the economic world, things are always changing. Things go out of favor. Other things come into favor. Uh, we don't live in a static world where everything returns to a particular norm. Uh, if we did, it would be very simple to invest. Just invest when something gets out of whack uh, on its historical ratio to other things. But life isn't that easy. Uh, investing isn't that easy. Speculating isn't that easy. And uh, what we have now is gold uh, much more valued than silver in terms of uh, historical relationships. And it's probably the same with oil also. If uh, crude oil is at 61 and silver is at just under $8, then uh, that ratio is somewhere around 8 to 1. And, uh, uh, you know, what should it be? At, at one time it was about 6 to 1 when silver was 5 and crude oil was at 30. And way back in the early 70s when crude oil was $3 an ounce and silver was $1.29, uh, the ratio was less than 3 to 1. So who knows? I mean, crude oil is much more valued today than it was in the 1970s. It's much more precious today than it was in the 70s. And it may be that crude oil will come down rather than silver going up. And it may be that gold will come down rather than silver going up if those ratios really do need to be restored. But I don't think they need to be restored because that's not the way the world works. If, the, if, the, if everything returned to its historical norm, the Dow Jones average would be like 600 right now. So you're saying that the, the old saw about everything regresses to the mean or the regression to the mean uh, does have some validity, but since the world is always changing and the uh, values of people with regard to uh, the available supplies uh, always changing. The demands are always changing, so the regression to the mean doesn't always hold true. Is that what uh, you're basically saying, Harry? Not only does it not always hold true, right. it probably rarely holds true, uh, simply because all the relationships have got to change as the the demand for things change. People change. Uh, I mean, who would have thought five years ago, uh, even just five years ago, that you could buy a VCR for $50 uh, when they were running 300 to $500. The same thing with computers and so on. They're not going to regress to, to $5,000 computers like we had 20 years ago. We'll be back in just a couple of minutes, so don't go away. Again, Harry Brown here with John Chandler, and we're talking about silver. And John has uh, been giving us the arguments that we've been receiving through email. And I should mention that you can email us. Just send uh, your message, your question, uh, anything you have to say to question at harrybrown.org. Question at harrybrown.org, and we will indeed try to address your question on this show. John, where are we? Well, we're thanking our sponsors who uh, just heard it. You heard just heard a commercial uh, about uh, gold and IRAs, and I should point out also that the money show is partially sponsored by the Permanent Portfolio Family of Funds, and one of their portfolios, the Permanent Portfolio, uh, does indeed have both gold bullion and silver bullion in that portfolio. So 
Uh, if you're interested uh, in that and for your IRA, you should feel free to call them at 800-531-5142, and they'll be happy to explain it to you. Uh, Harry, you've dealt with the gold-silver ratio uh, and generally with other ratios, but it is uh, somewhat interesting, and what caught my eye is that uh, silver being uh, undervalued uh, compared to other things, uh, uh, almost everything else. And generally when that is the case, uh, it does seem as though uh, that the price of the one undervalued item uh, has in the past tended to be poised to uh, increase. So do you think it's worthwhile to uh, take a look at uh, keep an eye on silver, and as Nicholas uh, Var- Vargas said uh, in his great book, uh, uh, Buy High and Sell Higher. What do you think about uh, keeping an eye on silver just based on it being undervalued compared to other things? I would not pay much attention to that. I really wouldn't because, as I said, it could just as easily mean that the other things are overvalued and ready to drop. And... Uh, Silver has been undervalued on that basis for 20 years. I mean, even back when gold was $300 an ounce, silver was running around 5 or $6 an ounce, which means that it was uh, uh, 50 to 60 ratio. So it was completely undervalued then by all the historical figures, and yet uh, all we've seen in the last uh, 25 years is an increase of about 50%, which is, not much for a 25-year period and not much to show for getting in when silver was undervalued in the 80s. So I would I would not uh, buy silver on that basis. There may be other reasons to buy silver, but I don't consider that one of them. Okay, Harry, another argument that we hear, and we've been hearing uh, for uh, 30, 40 years now, uh, is uh, that... Uh, uh, most of the gold that has ever been bidded is still around. It's still around in in, in uh, jewelry. It's around in uh, gold bars uh, stacked in uh, different uh, depositories, uh, mints around the world. Uh, but silver is being used up faster than it's being produced. The argument is that the uh, available above-ground supply is being used faster than it can be replaced, and the above-ground supply is gradually dwindling away to the point where it's a a shortage. And they bring up the uh, argument about the inelasticity of of the silver supply. So first, you might talk about what the inelasticity means, and uh, as a result of being a byproduct of other mining, and then let's deal with the shortage question. Yeah, inelasticity simply means that changes in price do not affect the supply or the demand, depending on what you're talking about. The inelasticity of supply means that even as the price goes higher, it won't encourage more production because so much of the silver is mined as a byproduct of copper, zinc, or lead, or gold even in some cases. And there presumably is an inelasticity on the demand also in that it's not easy to substitute for silver. But one of the problems with the shortage question is that, generally speaking, those people who cite the statistics overlook the recycling of silver, which became a big thing in the 70s when prices started taking off, and recycling, which had not been economic before then, suddenly became economic at the higher prices. Uh, we're not at a dollar twenty-nine anymore, and a lot of silver is recycled. And if you factor that into the supply, adding it to the new production of silver, the shortage is not what it appeared to be at the, the outset. Now, there's another factor that we need to address here, And that is we need to understand that gold is primarily a monetary metal and only incidentally an industrial metal. Gold is used in some industrial functions, but it is primarily a monetary metal, and that's why the gold still remains above ground, because it's being held in reserves at some central banks. It's being held in reserve by individuals and corporations all around the world who want a uh, a supply of something that is worth something that is different from the currency in which they normally trade. 
and gold is the second most popular form of money in the world after the U.S. dollar. So uh, it's natural that there's so much gold above ground. Now, I said gold is primarily a monetary metal and only incidentally an industrial metal, while silver is just the opposite. It is primarily an industrial metal and only incidentally a monetary metal. So it cannot be compared with gold. It is not a substitute for gold. It is a completely separate commodity. And we'll continue with that in our final segment when we wrap this up after this break. This is Harry Brown with John Chandler. Don't go away. This is Harry Brown. My book, Fail Safe Investing, will tell you what you need to know to create your own bulletproof investment portfolio, one that will protect you whatever the future brings, prosperity, inflation, recession, even depression. And it will protect you without your having to predict the future or tinker with the portfolio. Best news of all, at LibertyFree.com, you can download the book for only $9.75. That's right, just nine seventy-five. You can read the book on your computer screen or print it out and read it in your easy chair. If you're tired of losing money on your investments, tired of the pressure of looking for the best investments, Here's the way to have your own bulletproof portfolio, no matter how big or small your savings. To get a free sample chapter from Fail Safe Investing, just go to libertyfree.com right now. That's libertyfree.com. This is John Chandler with Harry Brown. You're listening to The Money Show on this beautiful uh, fall afternoon. We're very happy to have you with us today, and we hope you'll join us again next week. Harry has been discussing the silver story, and we've gone through uh, most of the two arguments uh, that are always around in favor of silver. Uh, Harry had discussed the nature of the inelasticity of silver supply, and uh, we're at the point now where uh, silver is not a monetary metal, uh, but is instead more of a, a industrial commodity, whereas gold is a monetary metal and only marginally a uh, industrial commodity. But, Harry, remember the days, uh, you probably don't go all the way back to the 1800s, but <laughs> uh, remember the days when the Civil Wars occurred, when they were uh, a big fight, a political flight, fight that influenced uh, presidential elections and all other elections oh, where, yeah. where uh, Ryan, they, they were... Don't, don't, uh, uh... Don't crucify us on a cross of gold. <laughs> William Jennings Bryan. Yeah, William Jennings Bryan, that's right. And yeah. uh, it was, uh, uh, this was when there was a battle to it, it demonetize uh, silver. And uh, some of us are old timers enough to remember the beautiful old silver certificate uh, where you could turn in your uh, notes and uh, receive silver for it. But, but uh, what that means is, is that silver was at one time uh, associated as a monetary metal. But yes. as, as the years have gone by, it has become more and more and more disassociated to the point where it is, if anything, only marginally a monetary metal. If yeah, that. it has no monetary significance to the U.S. Treasury anymore. Period. No silver certificates to be turned in. There are no silver in the coins except for, what is it, the silver dollar. And that's more just like a, making a commemorative out of it. And uh, uh, it just has no monetary significance at the U.S. Treasury anymore. But you can spend a silver dollar for a dollar. Yeah, absolutely. Which uh, means there is... And you can spend a, a copper nickel quarter for a quarter. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I remember those days in the late 70s, uh, very early 80s, when people were taking their uh, uh, pillowcases filled with the uh, silverware, uh, loving cups, uh, platters, uh, everything they could dig out uh, when silver was going up in price, $20, $30, $40 in value. They were taking uh, all the silver that they could scramble together, junk silver is what it was called, mm -hmm. uh, to their uh 
coin dealer who would weigh it out, uh, assay it, it uh, they would get a pretty handsome price for it. And so, one, one famous silver uh, uh, investment counselor said that this was proof that silver was poised to go further upward. When the public is selling, you want to be buying. And, of course, the public was right. And they were selling around 40 or $50, uh, all this junk silver. Well, those were the days, John. And there will be other days with other uh, commodities. And uh, we will keep our eye on silver. And, of course, we're talking about it as a speculative investment, not as a part of the permanent portfolio. John, thanks so much for joining me today. Thanks uh, to John Harmon in Minneapolis, a suburb, uh, so that uh, we could stay on the air. And above all, be sure to come back next week. You hear? Come on back. Come back, sweet papa.